Welcome to another episode of Outlier Academy, a show about the misfits, rebels, and idealists reshaping the way we work, live, and play. You're home for incredible conversations with the best entrepreneurs and investors working today. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, we sit down with Dave Eisenberg of ZigCap to learn about his career building and investing in real estate technology. To date, Zig has raised over $350 million to invest in early stage technology companies focused on real estate. Their portfolio includes incredible companies from vertically integrated players like Procore to new retail concepts like Camp. And in this episode, we explore some of Dave's early investments in Bonobos and Matterport and what he learned from watching them scale over more than a decade. What's unique about the real estate industry, including why it's traditionally less innovation focused and more risk focused, their process for making investments at Zig, and the wave of real estate technology companies that have started to go public, including Procore and Matterport. To learn more about Zig, visit their website at zigcap.com and follow them on Twitter at zigcap. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 45. And if you haven't already, you can find us on Twitter at Outlier Academy and subscribe to our channel on YouTube at youtube.com slash Outlier Academy for more great quotes, ideas, and interviews from guests like Dave Eisenberg. And with that, let's jump in with Dave. Dave, welcome to Outlier Academy. I am so excited to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. So today we're going to explore a bunch. I mean, we're going to explore your journey as an entrepreneur, your shift to becoming an investor. We're going to explore venture capital in a big way and talk about the specific areas you focus on. But I thought a neat place to start is to take us back in your career. And I remember you telling me a fascinating story about this office space moment that you had while working at Bain. <laughs> you can pick up from there and carry forward. Yeah. So my professional career began at Bain & Company, which is a management consulting firm that requires recruits heavily at a certain set of colleges. And the very first assignment that I had, I was sent to Southern New Jersey, which was not far enough from New York City to be an overnight trip, but rather something I had to get up at 6 a.m. every day and go down there. But I was put in a conference room that actually did not have windows. It was an interior conference room. And the assignment I was given in a nutshell was to make a financial model of different positions tied to employee ID numbers and figure out who could be let go and who could be offshore to Hungary. And the only real like understanding I'd had of office culture had been from watching the movie Office Space. And I remember thinking that my assignment was eerily similar to, the, <laughs> to what those guys were put on, you know, writing TPS reports. And the truth is, Bain is an absolutely wonderful place to work. The people are just incredibly creative and bright and outgoing. I just was not a fit for being an entry-level associate consultant because that work is largely Excel-driven. It's largely focused on people who are very detail oriented at making awesome slides and making like what they call zero defect models. And I'm just not that good at paying attention to detail, to be honest. I much more enjoyed the things that the partners at the firm work on, which is delivering strategy to Fortune 500 CEOs. Of course, I was not qualified to do that as a 22-year-old, but I remember the first feedback session I had with them and they said, it would be helpful if you tried to be less of a partner and more of an associate consultant. <laughs> And, and basically, I decided to leave Bain early because it wasn't sparking joy in me as a young 20-something. And I ended up going to work for a guy who had started his career at Bain and who was recruiting for his first employee, which had the title chief of staff before that became kind of a more common topic in the startup world. And the job started, the company was Bonobos, the men's clothing company. At the time, they only sold pants and they only sold them online. So my parents thought this was an absolutely horrible career move you know, for me to jump from a well-branded consulting firm to a clothing, to an e-commerce clothing, pants online. And I was also not a very fashionable person, nor was I like very interested in fashion. So it was a, a strange fit. But the, I found the CEO who became one of my best friends, this guy, Andy Dunn. He became a great mentor to me and he was a fantastic guy to work for because he did give me a lot of the training that I think I would have gotten had I stayed longer at Bain, but he gave me a lot more responsibility as a young person. The job started in his apartment, which he was sharing with some people post-business school. And I remember showing up the first day of work and he opened the door like in a bathrobe. And I was like, what have I done with my life for my career? I stayed with Bonobos from employee one, where I was the chief of staff of precisely zero staff on the first day to about 50 people uh, several years later. And I left to go to Silicon Valley, where I had gotten 
to know a guy who's now a partner at the venture firm Greylock. At the time, he was an entrepreneur in residence there named Josh McFarland. Josh had just finished several years at Google where he had studied a lot about what Amazon was doing and how poorly other top online retailers were mirroring Amazon's personalization technology and their sort of one-to-one marketing tech. And so his idea was basically to take a lot of the capabilities that Google had been investing in to do very large-scale data analysis. This is sort of the 2010 era, so it was the, really the beginnings of big data, and basically apply it in a software solution that other online retailers could employ. And that business went on to be a great success. It was acquired by Twitter for over half a billion dollars in a very capital-efficient way. And I was not the first employer, but I was among like sort of the first five or six people at the company. And it was a great experience to sort of see the difference between how Silicon Valley, I think, thinks about building companies and scaling versus New York City and sort of a tech light business in e-commerce. And so I was glad to have had both of those experiences. Interestingly, it was inside of Telepart that I also reconnected with Andy, the Bonobo CEO, to set up an early, a very small early stage investment firm, the beginnings of which really were meeting the Warby Parker guys when they were still at Wharton. And they came to visit Bonobos and they said, hey, what e-commerce platform are you using? And how do we hire a CTO? And all these questions that we had sort of bungled our way through in 2008 and 2009. But it gave us the understanding that as operators and early stage founders, we might actually have some unusual and proprietary deal flow. And so we started effectively syndicating angel investments. I recall Andy had a negative net worth at the time because he had so much student debt from Stanford's business school. And I had just no savings at all because I hadn't really worked for very long. So we were raising five and 10K checks from people to deploy into startups, but it was super fun. We ended up actually making some really great early stage investments, you know, sort of luckily. And one of those investments turned out to be a very key sort of career inflection point for me. Living in Silicon Valley in 2011, I had started attending a series of meetups. And one meetup that I was really interested in was the topic of 3D printing and 3D data capture and ended up meeting these two exceptionally talented engineers who had been hacking the Microsoft Connect camera to actually do 3D scans of objects, furniture. And this company went on to be called Matterport, which is now a public company, which is crazy to think about a decade later. But when I saw that they were scanning objects, it immediately sort of got my brain thinking about, hey, if we can scan these objects and then situate them in a 3D scan of a place that people might care about, say, your apartment or your home, you could have a whole new paradigm for doing e-commerce. What's interesting to see is like it's taken like a decade for that to actually become viable technically. But Matterport was this business that I just fell in love with, ended up writing the biggest check that I had ever put into a business at Matterport. We also did a deal out of this fund, Red Swan. And then I actually joined the venture firm Excel with a vision of building an e-commerce platform that would sit on top of the data that Matterport was capturing. That turned out to be a little too early for sort of the state of the camera. And so I ended up pivoting the business that I was working on, which was called Floored, into 3D visualization for an industry where you have to sell a space in a different condition than how it currently looks, which is commercial real estate. And we ended up actually building a decent sized business. You know, we got 50, 60 employees and we kind of hit this moment. We were four or five years in and we're about 5 million in recurring revenue. And I thought to myself, I actually don't know if I could take this business to 25 or to 50 million in ARI. I'm just not sure that the market is there. And so one of the luckier and I guess smarter things I did in hindsight was not raise a Series B because... I kind of had this concern that we were not going after a big enough pie. I would have had to bet the company basically on VR and that really blowing up. And I don't think VR actually has yet hit the types of penetration that would have been required for that to happen. And so rather than raise more money, we actually decided to sell the business. We almost sold the business to WeWork. I spent a lot of time with Adam Newman and a lot of his colleagues at the time, uh, one of whom we've subsequently backed in out of our new fund, which is a really fortuitous, you know, circuitous way that life works. But we ended up selling the business to CBRE, the Fortune 500 commercial real estate services firm. I sort of moved into an innovation role that they hadn't really had before, which is kind of a scan the market for interesting technology to adopt or invest in or acquire. And so I got a chance to travel the world and work with some really talented executives who have built just a juggernaut there over many many years. And uh, they treated our team really well. We grew to about 100 people internally. But I had this big realization, which is that I didn't want 
to be the CEO of that business 20, 30 years down the line. And I think what I learned about myself was that this thing that I had always thought to be true, which was my goal in life was to be a CEO of a very large, important publicly traded business, just required that I be a lot better at management than I actually feel like I am. And so that was like a light bulb for me, which was that, hey, maybe this investing thing, which is functionally a small group effort, making decisions and not actually ever building a very large entity in terms of people, maybe that would be a better career path for me. And so the mixture of early stage deals we had done at this entity, Red Swan, which I had with the Bonobo CEO, coupled with what became my domain expertise over about an eight, nine year period of working in real estate and the associated things around real estate, like construction and physical retail, became the thing that I thought I was most qualified to do. And so I started talking with a few people in the institutional LP world. I had a very good friend at Ribbit Capital, which had built a leading venture firm with a, a fintech focus. So they had done the sector focused fund, in my estimation, better than anybody else. And when I talked to them, they said, we really think you should go and you should do this and we'll actually invest in you to go and build your own sector focused fund. They introduced me to a bunch of their LPs, which immediately sort of gave me an audience of institutional capital that I don't think I would have been able to get on my own, to be honest. And that was really the genesis for Zig. I left CBRE in the first quarter of 2019. We did our final close on our first fund a few months later. And then we invested fund one in 2019. COVID hit, which we could talk about later, You know, just became this radical paradigm shift for the real estate industry. And we ended up raising fund two in 2020. And now we're in the middle of that. We've got our little team here and I'm in my office right now. And it feels a little surreal after so much time working from home. But that's kind of how I ended up investing out of my fund, which is called Zig. Uh, it's named for, my wife is a bit of a classics nerd or geek. And I asked her like, what is you know, an old like Roman or Greek real estate illusion. And she said, why pick like Roman or Greek? Why not go to like to the dawn of civilization, pick something earlier? And we ended up triangulating to the thing that preceded the pyramids, which was this kind of proto pyramid called the ziggurat. And I liked the word because it was distinctive. And we also liked the double entendre of sort of zigzag. You know, there's that famous paradigm. I think it was one of the benchmark founders who said, you really want to be non-consensus in your investments and you want to be right. That's sort of how you find the exceptional returns. And so Zig became came this kind of two-pronged thing of the ziggurat was originally built to try to reach the heavens. That was like, if you think like the Tower of Babylon, the intent of the real estate. And so we thought it was a good metaphor for venture capital where you're reaching for these stars. And then we liked the idea of maybe thinking a little bit differently. Many of the other groups in our sector had decided to raise their capital from the real estate industry, which we decided not to do. And that's sort of how we ended up doing what we do today. So Zig today is a sector-focused venture fund that invests in technology businesses that touch real estate construction construction, retail, and sort of the fintech layer around them. And we generally do early stage investments with the occasional growth stage deal. That's probably the best and most detailed background anyone's given. That was incredible. And I love the backstory of Zig. I'd love to try to pick at a couple of the threads there. I mean, one, just going all the way back to Bonobos, you know, in thinking, you made the point that obviously you were a chief of staff before that became this hot, iconic, I don't know, or, or very common thing within Silicon Valley. What did you learn about that role? And I don't know, how did it help you think about the purpose of that role in a company and just any lessons learned? Yeah. So I learned a ton because I didn't know that much prior. So everything was sort of learning. But I guess the way that I had conceptualized and the reason why I was interested was because Andy had written this incredibly hilarious job description. I wish I could find it. So much of it is probably not PC today. But the job description was kind of like, you're going to be a mini CEO. You're going to figure out what technology platform we're going to work on. You're going to recruit all of the first early employees. You're going to build our first financial model. You're going to get to do all these things. And I thought, that sounds fascinating. Just the ability to touch all of the different parts of the business. At one point, my nickname at the company was Super Leverager 3000 because of a quick program that we had whipped up to spit out all of the day's most important metrics for e-commerce. Then we named that report Super Leverager. And so I became like the robot version of that. But I think the best parts of that role are your main job is to provide leverage to a leader at the firm, the person who you are the chief of staff for. It's all about taking stuff off of their plate so that they can do more and better strategic things. I would say the worst part of the job is that you fall in this very weird spot on an org chart where you ultimately end up recruiting in more senior people to functionally lead departments like marketing or finance or technology. And oftentimes you have a closer relationship to the CEO, but you have 
none of the authority of running a division of the business. And so you become a little bit like a gatekeeper. And I think to be 22 and to be a gatekeeper 23, as I was at the time, where some of the people who were leading divisions a year or two later were in their 30s, 40s, or even 50s, that felt like I was a little bit miscalibrated to where I should have been. So I think whenever I talk to people who are contemplating chief of staff roles today, I typically want to like vet whether these org dynamics have been properly thought through. Because in the worst case scenario, you can end up like an assistant, which is really not the purpose of the role. The purpose of the role is to do a lot of important work that the CEO maybe shouldn't be like, she shouldn't be fully hands in in the weeds on. And to be a little bit of a screener of like, how best should the person who I'm working for be spending their time? And it's important that you have a CEO who knows what they want in a chief of staff. And it's also important that you have the rest of the infrastructure thought through in terms of levels of seniority and whether maybe there are actual people who are doing more EA work there, but you just don't want to have it be ambiguous because that can create issues. Yeah, I imagine as well, it probably really helps if the CEO has a good amount of self-awareness in terms of just where their strengths are, where they're not as strong. Any commentary kind of insights there? Yeah, this was something where Andy actually has an extraordinary level of self-awareness to the point where I found it like very shocking as a young person to be hearing someone so openly talk about their own flaws and then my flaws as well. Like it was a culture of radically transparent feedback. They had recently taken a business school class. Both of the founders had went to Stanford's business school called Touchy Feely, where everybody was very in touch with their emotions. And I was not in touch with my emotions <laughs> at that age. And so it became this thing where I had to like really mature quite quickly. I had to learn that you don't get strength from hiding your weaknesses. You actually get strength from identifying those weaknesses and being open about them so that you can help other people help you get better. And that was a massive learning for me. But I agree that a high degree of self-awareness on the leadership team will often be a way to include better managers, you know, on that team. And ultimately, I think what Andy was great at was investing in other people's career growth. And one of the things that he did at Bonobos that I'll never, ever forget was he kind of set me free two and a half years in. He said, in a very kind way, he's like, I think you've done a lot here at this firm. I think maybe you should go to another firm and have a bigger impact at a higher thing. And he's like, I'm not going to fire you. You know, this is ultimately your call, but I think your career is going to grow faster elsewhere than here. And that for me was this like blessing because it allowed me to opt into like doing a proper job search without the fear of like not having time left. And that was when I found Josh at Telepart. And Josh was just a very different type of leader. He had much more domain expertise on the technology front. He was a product manager at Google and a very good one at that. And so I just learned very quickly about the importance of upping my technical game. It was a very technical product that we had to learn how to sell, or I had to learn how to sell. And so it was a really nice complimentary experience. And this is one of the things that I end up advocating for people who ask for career advice is in the early years where you're optimizing for learning rather than earning, like really try and accumulate disparate skills. And this ultimately came back to how I thought about building Zig, the firm, you know, my partner and I have very complementary skills rather than overlapping skills. But it became a real business school education for me just without going to business school. And a quick aside on that, the reason why I didn't go to business school is because at Bonobos, I was oftentimes like recruiting for various roles and the applicants we would get for a lot of these roles were coming from business school. And so I said, like, if these people are ultimately applying for roles that are going to be reporting to me in some capacity, like, I'd be crazy to go back in time and go to business school. And so I think I missed out on a lot of fun, but I actually think that working in the companies was the fastest way for me to grow. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to talk about a handful of companies that you've invested in early on. But one thing I want to talk about is just your experience early on in companies like Bonobos and in companies like Matterport. And I think part of why I want to ask that question is, I've often had the realization as someone in venture that having worked in an early stage venture company, you just have a much more realistic assessment of what that looks like early because it doesn't look tidy. It doesn't look neat. It's messy and creative. And then the other piece would just be thinking about that experience with Matterport. What did you learn from kind of backing these two really smart engineers that you thought were working on something interesting and then being a part of that journey for 10 years, which is an incredibly long period of time? (laughs) Yeah, totally. And it's not just them, right? A lot of the companies that we invested in, in the sort of 2009, 10, 11 vintage are today going public. Companies like Warby and Turo, 
others like Procore, which have gone public recently. It does take a while to go from true seed to public companies. I'm of the point of view that there is no one way to build a venture career. My best friend from college, my roommate of like seven years is a partner at Bessemer, and he was never really an operator. He was a pure play investor, and he's a fantastic investor. And he was sort of groomed in the role of like a Jeremy Levine or a Fred Wilson or Peter Fenton. Like there are many, many investors who don't work in an operating capacity who just are tremendous at what they do. And look, I think you know, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz have really have really tried to like be the most vocal about the importance of having operating experience in terms of building camaraderie for founders. But like you can have a tremendously successful firm without that. So I'm not prescriptive in it. I would say for me, it was very important to have both e-commerce experience at Bonobos, B2B software experience at Telepart, and then domain expertise working in real estate like at Matterport and at Floored as a way to get credibility with founders that we can skip a lot of the 101, maybe even 201 stuff and go to like the meteor issues. And I think a lot of what we do today at Zig is try to convince early stage founders who are comparing working with us versus a generalist firm who may not spend all of their time thinking about these problems that the learning curve will go faster with us or that we can help them avoid non-obvious pitfalls. I really think that that's a key piece to us winning very competitive deals. But I think to answer the question specifically, what those experiences all did for me was give me credibility with other founders in the category. So I don't have credibility with the Warby founders unless I have the Bonobos experience. I don't have credibility with companies like Juniper Square or VTS, where we were very early investors that have now gone on to do great things in commercial real estate, if I didn't have the Florida experience. And then also the CBRE experience, which I think has increasingly been helpful to those companies that are scaling into public businesses. I think to your point about patience, one of the things I try to be very clear about with people who are new to investing in venture is that they're very rarely linear paths. You know, I think about Matterport not even being really focused on real estate in the early years, ultimately coming to the point of view of real estate and then being very focused on hardware rather than on software for a long time. And so that was like not the cleanest path. I'd say Floored was very focused on scanning 3D places. And then we pivoted to be focusing on rendering places that don't exist. That was a non-obvious pivot. There are countless examples. SnapDocs is a business that I've been a, a very early and consistent investor in. It's now one of the leaders in sort of mortgage software. And SnapDocs had a period of time where the business was sort of not growing that quickly. The mortgage market itself had sort of frozen and this is sort of 2015, 2016 period. And then they later got onto this exponential growth curve path. And I think there was a moment where if you had had conviction at a point of weakness, or maybe a better example would be Coinbase. You know, Coinbase had this moment of crypto winter that was right in the middle of the company's history. And there weren't that many people who were that excited about investing when Bitcoin's price wasn't moving very much at all. Like Ethereum was still valued super inexpensively. In the and, hundreds. <laughs> uh, yeah, or way less than that, you yeah. know, the single dollars. And so I think that it is an unfortunate reality that it's not a very interesting story to cover a startup that is doing fine or even doing worse than fine, like doing eh. No one really likes to talk about that. And so as a result, it's not broadly known that a lot of companies that you today think of are, are great. I mean, think about Procore. Like Procore got started in 2002. It took about 12 years for Procore to really start turning on this like exponential growth curve. And now it's a juggernaut you know, in the public markets. Almost but, 20 years later which is incredible. Yeah, it's a valuable lesson for people who are looking for overnight riches and overnight success is that a lot of great businesses do not follow that pathway. They ultimately are the result of a lot of grit, a lot of tenacity and fighting through some tough times and moments. And I think one of the things that fellow entrepreneurs love is both sharing these stories and also ideally helping to avoid pain for future businesses. And so I think one of the reasons why startup CEOs do love having venture investors who have either been in the trenches in these really tough operating moments. I love Ben Horowitz's book about the hard thing about hard things. Or on the non-operating side, have seen companies through very tricky periods. I think about like Bill Gurley and Uber and others. And I think just feeling like you get to borrow from those learnings and experiences is really a great reason to work with a venture investor. I'd love to ask one more question and then move on and begin to explore the real estate space, which I think is fascinating. And that question is, and this may be overly broad, so feel free to take this kind of any direction, but as someone who has had substantial operating experience and is now on the investing side, just when you look back at that time period, and I'm sure you're constantly learning today from the entrepreneurs you work with on those conversations, 
conversations you have. But when you look back at your own experience, were there any big insights or big lessons that shape the way that you work with entrepreneurs or just any valuable insights from being an operator at several different phases? The most important lessons have all come around the recruitment and the retention of talent. And I think what I've seen and then also observed firsthand experience is that great founders never stop recruiting. They are always recruiting. Sometimes they're looking to level up people that they recruited a year or two ago. Sometimes they're looking to correct for mistakes. Sometimes they're looking to correct for their own flaws and try to externalize challenges that they're having, hopefully with other people who might be better to solve specific problems. But I love the paradigm of like A's higher A's, B's higher C's. And you always want to know what you are and then what the people around you are. But I personally have been attracted to operating in environments where the people around me are better than me or just are going to be in playing such high levels of whatever that is that they're doing that it really like causes my motivation level to jump or so forth. And conversely, like the companies where I've made mistakes in investing, I think have not had this dynamic or they've lost it somewhere along the way where in the pursuit of growth, they've reduced their thresholds, their bars for talent. And so I think like one of the truest senses of a company's quality is like the incremental person who's being brought onto the team in any function, in any department is that person up-leveling the overall average or are they diluting it? And I think if you can, as an investor, if you can get a feel for that, for the quality of the talent that's being attracted to the business, I often think this quality of magnetism that a founder needs to have to recruit employees one through 10, especially because like, it's just a fact of life that the equity drop-off from the founders to the early employees is quite massive. So to be an early employee, you really need to believe almost to the level of intensity that the founders do that this is the right call for you, either because their culture is so amazing or you love the problem space they're working on, or because you're a very economic person, you think they're going to go build a tremendous business. Like all of the early employees at places like Coinbase and Uber and others like did it unbelievably well. And so a uh, Facebook, of course. So I think that as an investor, what you're looking for is, do the founders intuitively get this? Are they constantly trying to bring in the best people they've ever worked with into their network? When a founder does references on someone, are they using those references to try to network to other talent that they could potentially recruit? It's the single most common problem I hear from our portfolio today. It's just recruiting has become incredibly difficult in a world where there are so many remote companies now of high quality, where someone can work anywhere. It's never been easier to start a company either. If you think about so much infrastructure, that you can rent to start a company. So really like you're taking a lot of the very natural early employees and some of them are getting peeled off to go start their own companies, which is awesome. And then some of them are just getting paid extraordinarily well, just given the nature for the global marketplace of competition for talent. So it's almost a requirement from our point of view that any investment that we make, we can see other very high quality people going to work for the founding team that we're backing. It's such an interesting point, and it's one I've definitely heard other people make. And it's interesting in my mind because, well, I guess just to ask the question, do you feel as strongly about feeling the same way about the other investors on the cap table? Just thinking about the companies that I feel like are the most impressive, they seem to be attractors of the best people, but across every single axis you know, in terms of they are managed to get a ton of press because people want to interview them. They're interesting. They happen to recruit very well. People want to invest in them. Does that quality extend far beyond? beyond recruiting just in and of itself? My self-assessment would be that I'm not consistent on this topic. I find that this is a highly bespoke question of like, if the question is, who are the right investors for this business? There are some businesses that are doing so well, have such a mature management team already, have such great investors on the cap table that I actually care about this a lot less. I care about the incremental investor, especially if they're not going to have a ton of rights related to like a board seat or something like that. Like maybe you just want the best and cheapest capital. There have been times that I have advocated for that. More often than not, that's not my framework. More often than not, I care a huge amount about who the incremental investor is in a round where we are leading and we're trying to hand allocate the rest or in a round where we've already invested and now we're effectively on the sales team of the founder to bring in the next investor and we're helping back channel price expectations and we're helping give people guidance as to where they need to be flexible or negotiable. If that other investor counterpart is someone who I think very highly of, I have often advocate that we take offers at lower prices because I believe that that 
firm or that person will actually deliver a return on that delta over time. And so it's a hard question to answer because there are situations where I have begged a founder not to take capital from an individual or from a firm who has been a bad actor in the past that I've seen. And there have been situations where I say, hey, this is a toss up. Just go with the person you like better socially, right? It's like, it really runs the gamut. More often than not, though, I think the point is apt, which is to say that I I believe that one should be thoughtful about every person who you bring onto the cap table. And in a world where there's a ton of capital, like you might as well get something more than just the capital from them. You might as well find that that person's going to help you with your design strategy, or they're going to help you with connections to the credit markets, or they're going to help you with international expansive. You might as well find investors who are going to do a little bit of work for you rather than just someone who's completely vanilla. Yeah, I heard an entrepreneur say this recently is, you know, that they really try to hoard the best investors, the best advisors, the best people. That word is necessarily the best word, but just this idea that you will always want the best people around the table. And for sure, there's a lot more value to be had in other ways than just capital. My only comment there is it can become too extreme, though. You can have a situation where a founder is obsessing over very small changes to the cap table and details, and you have to say to them, like, this is probably not the best use of your time. You should be focused on this other thing because this is rarely going to come up. Yeah, you can. I feel like that's a meta lesson is you can over index on almost anything. Yes. <laughs> it's important yeah. to have that sense. I'd love to explore the real estate space. And I feel like Procore is a really interesting example. I've spent some time recently learning about that business as it came onto the public markets. And I did not know, I had not gone to the level of depth to know that it was founded in 2002, which is fascinating just to think about that kind of arc. But zooming way out, I feel like my perception, and I know this is changing, but I think it's most people's perceptions, especially people that have been in the real estate industry, that historically, and there's actually quite a few industries that are like this, it's been almost neglected by tech or it's been almost anti-tech in terms of just the way that that industry has operated. So I'd be curious just for your perspective on that. What is the arc that you see happening in real estate tech? And what are some interesting trends that you've seen over the last 20 years? So there are a few things that are non-debatable. So real estate and construction industry sort of next to real estate as a percentage of their overall revenues has spent among the least on technology. Like if you contrast it to retail, which has had the threat of Amazon, like competing with traditional retailers, retail spends 10 times the amount of money on technology as a percentage of revenue than real estate or construction, which has historically spent among the least out of any industry in the entire country. And so you wonder like, well, why is that the case? Well, there's a few artifacts about out real estate that have led folks to not particularly lean into innovation. First, I would say is a culture of risk avoidance, right? Like buildings need to stand and they need to stand for a very long time and they need to be very secure. The capital that gets invested in real estate is looking for safety primarily more than opportunistic return. Oftentimes, real estate has had this bond-like quality to it that has made it very attractive to institutional LPs who can really scale. And then real estate has also lended itself well to monopolies. So you've had a fixed amount of land land. No one can force you to sell a building that's standing on that land. And so a lot of real estate has been passed and a lot of very successful sort of tax law lobbying over hundreds of years has resulted in a lot of real estate is tied up in a relatively small number of families and institutions. And if you just held that real estate over a very long period of time, you did extraordinarily well, or if you held the land and you leased the land to others. So as a result, there hasn't been much that has forced the real estate industry's hand about why should I do anything different or better? And I'd say the founding thesis of Zig was actually a deep fascination with the future of autonomous transportation. Specifically, I was very interested in how electric shared autonomous vehicles might radically change where people want to live in the world, which would be a thing that would move the demand for specific real estate in specific places to such a degree that you wouldn't care if a building that you needed to get to was a few miles away or was off Maine and Maine, but was rather somewhere else. Like Historically, real estate value was clustered with public transit hubs. Think about the subway line in Manhattan or think about the BART in San Francisco. The closer you were to these major movers of people, the more value that you had. And I thought that it was possible that next generation transportation, like the robotization of transportation, would actually unbundle 
the famous real estate maxim of location, location, location from value. And that that was going to cause the real estate industry to start to act a lot differently as they needed to attract tenants and retain tenants who have much more fluid preferences on where they want to be. If you had told me that two years into our fund's history, that a global pandemic you know, was going to prove this point well in advance, I would have not believed you at the time. And I also didn't really understand how positive this was going to be. It's a horrible word to use because it's obviously a tragedy that we continue to live with this. But I do think in terms of the acceleration of the modernization of some legacy industries, this pandemic has actually moved the world forward faster. And the real estate industry and the construction industries have been hugely impacted by COVID in terms of both the movement of people, where people want to be, obviously work from home is a tremendous depressor of demand for commercial space in in highly urban environments. And I think as e-commerce disrupted the need for physical retail, like so too is this happening, I think, for a lot of different segments of the economy. The digitization is changing the needs for physical bank branches or the need to do notarization in person or the need to sign mortgage documents in person. Like a lot of stuff is changing quite quickly. Virtual tours, right? Talking about Matterport, right? This was a tremendous acceleration of demand in a world where you need to do virtual tours and there's a lot of people moving around. So I guess what we are observing in real time is that the real estate industry is realizing that the industry is not as stable as it used to be, and it is not going to be as stable going forward, that there are more things changing, whether those things are stuff like climate change or whether it is pandemics or whether it's consumer preferences with Gen Z and millennials who are unbelievably different types of humans than you know well <laughs> boomers and others. So I think this is an interesting time to invest in what we invest in, in the same way that coming out of the 08 regulation and all the changes that were happening that reduced the footprint of big banks like fintech was just this amazing thematic approach one could have had to venture starting in the 09 sort of 2010 vintage. It's our belief that coming out of COVID, this is going to be a very similar moment for real estate tech. And so we're seeing similar to like the crypto industry, where is talent flowing? I think we're seeing a ton of very high quality traditional tech talent who's looking at the size of the real estate markets, who's looking at the degree of change that's happening. And they're saying, I think I'm going to go after a really, really big market, be that construction or residential real estate or commercial. And I think the other industry where that's happening other than crypto is healthcare. And so we also look at a lot of things that are in sort of healthcare retail as well. So I find that I'm in a a bit of a lucky moment where the thing that I'm qualified to do is also sort of having a major growth spurt and is being roiled by a lot of generational change, even within the real estate industry. The real estate industry is a lot older than other industries within America. The average age of drywallers in the late 40s, the average age of a real estate agents in the early 60s. And so you find that there's going to be some generational change in the industry that's going to cause either the adoption of new tech and trend at a much higher pace, or the, it's going to be disrupted. I would say there's a few companies in our portfolio that I would accurately categorize as competing with the legacy real estate industry much more than selling to them. And some of those companies are the ones that I'm the most bullish on. Maybe to flip it, something I'd be curious, we talked about this a little bit one-on-one as we were preparing for this interview, but what's been interesting to me and part of why I was really excited to have this conversation is I feel like I've seen this through the lens of some really interesting real estate focused companies that have come public. And we're starting to see a wave of those, whether it's Doma, whether it's Open Door, other examples. And so just to zoom out from those particular examples, and you can feel free to bring those back up, but what public companies do you think are doing really interesting things innovating in retail at the moment? Yeah. So look, I'm going to talk my book here a little bit, but I think Warby Parker, which is, you know, on the eve of their own direct listing, really has the perfect omni-channel business. They have an incredibly compelling and differentiated physical retail experience. I love going to the Warby store. It feels like going into like a beautiful library setting. The people are friendly. There's not a lot of pressure to buy, and yet it's fun to do so. And the e-commerce experience, they were the first to have the try-on at home experience, send you five, send the stuff back. They've now gotten really good at applied augmented reality 
reality. So you can actually get like a legitimate eye exam from home and also see what the glasses will look like. And so I think more than anybody that I've seen, they have nailed the, you're just our customer. It doesn't matter if you're our customer in our store, if you're a matter if you're our e-commerce customer, we meet you where you are. And hopefully we build a compelling enough experience that we pull you into our stores because they're fun places to come and shop and experience. They were very early to do branded experiences. Like I remember going to the Warby Parker Street Fair in Soho one year, and I just like brought my young kids and it was so pleasant. It was so fun. It was so wholesome. I love that Warby's thing is reading. Obviously, it makes sense with glasses, but it's just like, it's such the right thing for creating a family-friendly environment. And there was no like pressure to buy anything. It was just like, this is who we are. Obviously, the Give One movement where they've given away millions of glasses to people in need, they were early there. So that's one that I'm incredibly bullish on holding for the ultra long term. But there are more. I think there are many other digitally native brands that have gone public and will continue to go public in the coming years. And all of whom I think have forced the question to traditional brands like, what is your digital strategy? You can't just have a lame, boring e-com experience because people will buy the cheaper, more commodity version elsewhere on Amazon or otherwise on an aggregator. And then what's fascinating to me to see in the real estate side is the degree to which people are reinventing the physical spaces. I'll give you another example from our portfolio. We are investors in a company called Tend, T-E-N-D, that is reinventing the dental experience. And what they identified was that the dental experience had a very low net promoter score. People don't like going to the dentist. They don't talk about going to the dentist. And they said, what if we reimagine this to be much more like a hospitality environment where you actually have extremely friendly staff, diverse staff who love to pamper you and who love to let you try new products. And then we also have a digital experience where you can book an appointment, see what your insurance is going to cover in advance. They just perfected the going to the dentist experience. When you go and you sit in the chair, there's a Netflix above you. It's preloaded with shows that you like to watch. You wear like cool glasses that block the glare actually from Warby Parker. So they really reinvented the whole thing. And I think their growth rate has just been astonishing, partly because there's a lot of creativity that's being exploded onto businesses that have not had a ton of it. That's one of the best things about this moment in time is I feel like thoughtful entrepreneurs are looking at every experience that has a poor net promoter score. And they're saying, is this a big category where I can reinvent something. And we see that in construction payments. You know, We see that in mortgage. We see that in stuff like title insurance. But, but look, there's going to be a lot more public companies in our category in the next five years than there have been. I'd say ones that I think have really created a culture of innovation and will continue to do great. One that's not in our portfolio is Open Door, where I just so deeply respect the quality of the talent on that team. Certainly Matterport, which I think has real big visions for where they're going to go. Procore has a company that is a partner to it today called Built that we think very high level in the private markets that I assume will be a public company, not too distant future. Outside of the United States, we have a, a company called Loft that is kind of building like a super app for real estate. So there's an iBuying component, there's a mortgage origination component, there's a rental marketplace platform. I think there'll be a public company in the next year or two. Also an extraordinary high quality founding team. So the short of it is, I think it's going to be a great time to be a public investor looking at prop tech. I think a lot of the prop tech companies that do best will have have fintech focus areas where they're doing things that sort of bleed into the fintech area. So it's a very blurry border between those two. And those are the types of businesses that we love investing in. I'd love to ask a follow-up question around, you mentioned that you're seeing some really interesting businesses that are this intersection of healthcare and real estate. Maybe Ten's a good example. It's interesting for me because I've been coming across companies like Brave Care is one I came across recently that's doing something really interesting. If you're a parent, you probably have had a not so great experience at a pediatrician, not that you don't have a great doctor, but just that the experience has a ton of friction and there's nothing about it that feels refined. And it feels actually like the perfect thing to peel off. And if you were to have a fully focused model, you can do something really interesting and differentiated. So I'd be curious, and it's going to be a wide open question, but any commentary you can share around what you think is interesting or interesting other examples of healthcare meets real estate? (laughs) Yeah, look, we're seeing this almost in every segment of healthcare. Like we're seeing people reinvent going to the dermatologist. My father's a dermatologist. I don't think he's used a computer in his office like for the last 30, 40 years. There are people that are reinventing stuff like in the ambulatory surgical center areas where people are externalizing surgeries from hospitals in order to save costs and also deliver better patient experiences. We're seeing stuff on the cosmetic side. We're seeing stuff in physical therapy and women's health. There's a lot of stuff that's happening in women's health, largely because it's been so neglected over the last 
25 years in startup land. I guess what we look for at Zig is we look for a business that fundamentally has a nice margin profile pre technology and then upon the addition of technology to how one acquires customers, to how one retains customers and sort of markets to them over time. And then through automation of workflows that don't necessarily need to be hand input by a person. Those are, I think are the beginnings of a business that could have a venture type profile. So I think one medical, so public business kind of pioneered this model, at least in the venture context of taking physical locations for primary care and building a membership model that has a recurring revenue characteristic, beginning to automate parts of how one books an appointment or flu shots and blah, blah, blah. We're seeing that business model across a bunch of different areas. In some cases, they're better businesses than one medical. They have a higher margin profile, they have less competition and so forth. But whether it's pediatrics or whether it's geriatrics, I think there are a lot of high quality entrepreneurs who want to do something meaningful. Some of those entrepreneurs are looking at doing stuff in the climate world and ESG, and there's a lot of stuff that intersects with real estate there. And some folks say they want to do something with healthcare, either because of a personal experience they've had or because they have a family member who has had some sort of personal experience. But I think those are some of the most compelling founding stories or when people want to dedicate 10, 20 years of their life or more to a problem, and it's deeply rooted in a personal experience. When you find the right magic of great business model that can be enhanced by technology with weak competition and an easy entry point, that tends to be magic for us. Yeah, that seems like the perfect setup. I want to ask one quick follow-up question to that idea. Just obviously thinking about whether it's Warby Parker, or whether it's these healthcare examples, all of those seem to suggest that this idea, and I don't want to conflate the two, but this idea that retail stores are dead, or this idea that malls are dead, or these ideas that street level commercial real estate are dead or are going away. What is your take there in terms of just from a trajectory perspective and just on that point? Obviously, I would guess you disagree with it, but just any commentary? Well, not necessarily. Like the United States has dramatically more retail space than other countries on a like-for-like basis. So I would not be surprised to see the retail industry in terms of physical locations and square footage contract dramatically. I don't know that we've yet seen the right idea to how to repurpose a class B or C suburban mall. It's not clear that all real estate is going to come back. I think that what we are seeing is that you can't just assume that if you put what I'll call like a thoughtless box somewhere that you can count on foot traffic coming through there. The internet is just delivering awesome experiences that are good enough that people don't feel like they need to leave their home. So on the contrary, everything that is being designed in the physical world has to be better than the purely digital experience to get the mind share and attention. I'll give you an example from our portfolio. We invested in a company called Camp. Camp is basically building I think of it like a next generation Disney where they're building a physical store that has experiences embedded that are really awesome experiences that you want to do with your kid. Like I took my daughter to a camp location on the Upper West Side. We spent like three hours there doing art projects together that were art projects that I couldn't easily do at home. That was the key. The key is like they've taken all these things that are not super easy to do at home and they brought it into the store. And then the toy stuff that they sell it's just not commodity toys. It's all like really well curated, thoughtful stuff that I'd never be able to find on my own. And so the combo of community plus experiences plus commerce, I think is very, very powerful. And camp has had unbelievable foot traffic retention compared to even stuff like grocery. So we've had seen some landlords who say, the best thing that I can do to reanimate or reactivate my mall or my physical location is to put something like a camp into there because it's going to do such a good job of attracting and retaining people to those locations. That's the future of retail is like things where it's fun, gets you out of the house. I think there's a lot of people who are looking to get out of the house. We looked at a business, uh, we're not investors in it, although I think it's a fascinating business that's building destination virtual reality experiences. So basically taking the fact that the computational hardware is still expensive and the physical hardware is changing every year or two. And they're saying, we're going to build destination experiences that are a mixture of entertainment, maybe even some education and some team events there. And I think that's a great idea. I don't know if it's going to be something that can take massive quantities of space, but the short of it is that every owner who I know who's being really thoughtful about like the next decade about their property is they're looking at the pace of innovation in their tenants. And this is something that they never, ever used to look at, but they want to know, like, am I taking a 10-year tenant whose credit 
is based on the fact that over the last 30 years, they were innovative, but is actively being disrupted today. Maybe I'd rather bat on the upstart who may not have those years of credit, but who has an awesome investor base, has really high quality talent. Maybe that's the tenant that's going to grow their footprint with me. And maybe I can get a leg up on attracting them to my space because I'm willing to bet on them in a way that my peer set is not. This is the type of stuff that's changing how one underwrites real estate in real time because real estate's a very backward looking industry in terms of betting on whether you're going to be a good tenant. But I think real estate in the future is going to be a lot more like venture. It's all going to be forward looking on, are you going to be bringing in the types of people that I want to my asset? Are you going to treat my location correct? Are you going to be someone who's going to expand in a footprint that maybe I can help support? That's the future. And I really think that there are more and more landlords who are not yet comfortable doing this, but are starting to build the muscle that over the next decade will enable them to be comfortable making forward looking hypotheses and bets rather than historical ones. It's a fascinating perspective. And as a parent, camp sounds incredible because I feel like parents are super underserved. You know, it's like you can go out to food. There's obviously movies. There happens to be bounce places and a handful of those places. But otherwise, it's just museums and I don't know, going outside. Yeah, I'm very, very bullish on camp's ability to create content that changes out more frequently enough that people love, as well as these sort of parent-child experiences that are fun for everybody. This is one of the things that I look for in books that I select for my kids is like, I actually want to read the books that we read because I think that my kids can pick up on my own levels of enthusiasm you know, in it as well. So I think it's something that camp is like unusually good at. Yeah, that's awesome. This has been an incredible conversation. I could do this for another hour, but I know you've obviously got a limit on your time. So I want to ask one follow-up question, which is the one thing I was going to ask, I thought might be interesting to explore, but we've covered so much ground in the time we've already talked is just for a, a map of the real estate space technologically. I know that may be hard to do. My question is, the stuff that I'm seeing is everything from Procore, which is obviously this very vertical play that's serving the construction industry and is offering a ton. It has a really interesting model, has a ton of different entry points for people. So it's that, which is an interesting vertical model. There's these underlying layers now of technology like Doma is an interesting example. There's also stuff like Latch, which you're like, okay, there can be a company that just focuses on (laughs) entry points and software. So maybe to constrain the question a little bit, like, where are you most interested? And are there things that you avoid or things you focus on more? Or it just seems like the bounds of this industry can be very fuzzy. (laughs) So one thing that's important as a sector focus fund is not define yourself so narrowly that you like turn yourself off to potentially good ideas. I think, look, at the highest level of abstraction, there are companies that are focusing on attracting tenants, on retaining tenants, on maintaining buildings and like physical environments. And then on the whole investment side of the stack, like how capital flows in and out of these assets. There are companies that span all types of real estate. There's commercially focused companies, residential, industrial, retail. You can slice it that way. And then you can also take all of the financial transactions in a building around placing a mortgage, putting a securitization in place. Like you can find all the places the dollars flow and there are probably startups being built around there. And the insurance market is a huge one in the real estate space. So we are careful not to rule out doing anything that's related because you never know when you're going to find an extraordinary team. I would say in general, we are more focused on the businesses that enable cost savings through automation than we are through any other type of business. And the way that that can manifest can be wildly different from business to business. So we have a company called Open Space that enables you to capture 360 degree photographic walkthroughs of construction sites every day and then track the changes that happen in there, they're growing like crazy in the construction industry because they reduce the need to do that with like a specialist visit and they can do inspections much faster and so forth. There are companies that use that data to figure out when can I release a construction draw for someone who's doing a site. We also have companies that are doing stuff like physical security at buildings using computer vision. There are companies that are automating all of the steps involved in getting a consumer mortgage. So making that process a lot simpler. There's a whole host of companies that are have new ideas as to how do I like fractionalize ownership in real estate and put it on a blockchain. I could never come up with all of the ideas and I'm glad you know that's the case. But I do think that the qualities of businesses that we love tend to be more technical rather than more of a real estate innovation. There's a lot of companies that are innovating on real estate in terms of like space design or in terms of how frequently one can get access to a space. Those tend to be lighter on the tech side and heavier on the real estate 
finance side. And just our thing is a little bit more like, let's try to find true software companies that happen to be working in this space. And then let's try to use our expertise on the real estate and construction side to help them grow faster. Mm -hmm. That seems really smart. You want to cast a wide net so you can be opportunistic and make sure you're not missing out on stuff because the markets, markets change, things evolve. For anyone that wants to learn more about ZigCap, wants to follow you, where can people find you online and learn more about Zig? Yeah, I wish I was awesome at social media. I'm not, but I'm constantly getting made fun of for like corny dad tweets and so forth. So our website is relatively simple, but it's zig, Z-I-G-G, cap, C-A-P dot com. We do keep an active running tally of our portfolio companies there. So you can click around and see that. And then we publish a few things from time to time, macro theses and so forth. Our LPs get the really good quarterly letters. On the personal front, I'd say I'm at Eisenberg on Twitter. Once in a while, I'll post stuff about our portfolio on LinkedIn and so forth. And this is just one of these things where it's just like, I found I'm not a natural social media guy. And so I try to do what I can to grow my footprint and then also to promote our portfolio companies. But there are people that are so much better at it than me and I'm jealous of them. Yeah, I fall right there with you. So I feel a similar pain. Thank you so much for the time, Dave. This has been incredible. It was my pleasure. I had a lot of fun and thank you for the great questions. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can find the show notes and transcript at outlieracademy.com slash 45, including links to everything we discussed, as well as a collection of five books, articles, and videos you can explore to learn more about real estate and real estate technology. For more from Dave, listen to the short bonus episode that follows this one, where I dive into everything from Dave's habits to the tools he loves, his favorite books, and more, all in less than 20 minutes. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or leave a short review on Apple Podcasts to help others find the show. Finally, you can visit outlieracademy.com to explore more incredible interviews with guests like Scott Belsky, Kevin Kelly, and the founders of Titan Rally and Primal Kitchen. Thank you so much again for listening. I'll see you right here next week on Outlier Academy.